good. So uh, today actually is our fourth brainstorming session. It's actually the fifth. It's four point five technically, but uh, because we did the uh, the brainstorming session last time, uh, 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 two parts in one is online and another one in in the general assembly, and this is the last uh, let's say discussion for the year. And uh, today will be a very interesting conversation on uh, lessons learned in localizing heritage and the SDGs. Um, we have three colleagues that are here with us to share their uh, thoughts. And also e-commerce Australia will be presenting uh, what they're doing as well. Um, as, as you are uh, aware, these uh, sessions are really to uh, provide different perspectives on how heritage and sustainable development comes together and um, it's a means of uh, creating a shared memory between us. We are all from different places uh, doing different things. And I hope that we can continue this conversation so that we are all you know, having uh, something that we learn together. Right? Uh, it's also a means of testing out different ideas, uh, co-create knowledge. And uh, it is an informal space, even though I, I speak very formally, but it's an informal space that we can all discuss and share our views. Uh, on the matter of heritage and sustainable development. Um, for the last uh, year, um, uh, for 2023, uh, we've had uh, several activities that we've had from various um, 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 national committees and ISCs. Uh, for example, Ecomus Jordan has created like a series of discussions, a focus group discussions with uh, workshops rather. Uh, with uh, students to identify how culture and heritage is coming together with sustainable uh, the SDGs. And some of uh, us uh, were also present in those discussions. Um, for Ecomos Philippines, uh, what has happened is that uh, the Ecomos uh, Philippines is part of what we call as the stakeholder chamber uh, for the National Economic Development Authority. And this, this chamber is the one that advises the government on SDG related issues. And it's a first, you know, ECOMOS doesn't usually uh, penetrate this kind of national discussions, but it's, I'm glad that the ECOMOS Philippines has done that. Uh, for ECOMOS Portugal and Brazil, what they've done is to translate the, the policy guidance. And uh, it was really a, a work between colleagues from um, two, uh, similar languages, they're the same, but uh, different nuances in the languages had to be resolved. And a presentation or like a workshop was done in, in Lisbon with colleagues from different parts of the world um, coming together to really localize and discuss uh, uh, what heritage and sustainable development is in, from a Portuguese, pers Portuguese speaking perspective. Um, ISC of Stone um, uh, is here with us. They're also gonna be um, uh, uh, Shui, uh will be presenting what they have been doing for the last uh, months and thinking about uh, in detail what it means for stone and uh, sustainable development. And uh, for for Ecomus Netherlands, Ecuc and IC Water, the, there was this uh, meeting in New York in uh, uh, U, um, Water Conference, uh, UN Water Conference, where we we went there and uh, we did some some activities and. Also, we did publish a paper on the blue papers, which is discussing what is the link of heritage, sustainable development, and water. And uh, lastly, for the Arab region, uh, they also did their translations, and it comprised of many, many countries that our, our colleagues are from to create this document. And I think for 2024, the plan is to create a shared discussion on what heritage and sustainable development is from the Arab perspective. So I don't know what will happen now because of these conflicts, but I do hope that these uh, discussions will still continue amidst all the challenges that are happening within the region. And lastly, of course, uh, many of us uh, were in, in the GA 2023, uh, familiar faces uh, online, and hopefully we will see each other again uh, soon. Right. So these are different activities for 2023, but of course, um, many, many more things are happening. Uh, this is just those that I'm aware of, but if you are doing some work uh, within your uh, own circles, within your committees, uh, do let me know, and then we can also map that out. Um, this is something that uh, Ele um, Maria will discuss later on, but uh, one of the things that we did was last year was to survey 
uh, the work uh, of how Ecomos links uh, with the SDGs. And uh, she created this wonderful uh, chart that is actually uh, saying that we do contribute to different goals. Uh, primarily, if you see that SDG 11, but uh, we also um, are very weak in some of the goals, you know, uh, hunger and poverty is not really something that a lot of Ecomos members discuss. And uh, how how do we reach that gap, you know, identify uh, potential um, discourses that are uh, for those uh, kinds of uh, issues, right? Um, Maria will also discuss later on uh, challenges and uh, opportunities. But uh, I think that um, we are all volunteers. Just the, the, the main thing is that we're all volunteers. We There's a big challenge. Funding is a challenge. But uh, synergies and and uh, engaging with local communities is a big opportunity that uh, I do hope that we all uh, go and take that opportunity. And uh, as Egi was saying, Egi is doing now, she's uh, in local government. So there's a lot of <laughs> synergies that can happen with uh, heritage practice and local government, right? Okay, so, um, and then I'll just go through uh, for this. Uh, we have three uh, colleagues who will be discussing. First is Maria Geralde. She has a bachelor in business management from the De La Salle University in the Philippines. And she has a master's in international business management in from ECHEC Management School in Belgium. And uh, Maria did another master's, which is a uh, focus on the sec sustainable development and KU Leuven. Uh, and uh, she will be finishing her um, ma second master's in January 2024. And she was our intern uh, last year, uh, this year, um, uh, last year, actually, I'm getting confused now. Uh, uh, and she finished her project on localizing the manual for the policy guidance. And she's currently uh, an intern and a sustainability related startup uh, uh, and finishing her master's by 20, January 2024. Elena will be um, discussing uh, the heritage in the five piece and she is a PhD student at the University of Ferreira with the program of environmental sustainability and well-being. And her research project focuses on the link between landscape interpretation and the democratization of heritage processes for ensuring inclusive and sustainable heritage practices. Um, so good morning, everyone. Oh, good morning from Belgium. Um, so I was an intern with Ecomos last October 2022 until January 2023. And my project was about the localization manual for the policy guidance. So who is this toolkit for? So this toolkit is meant for the national committees, the working groups, and the international scientific committees of ECOMOS. And so why create a localization manual? So it was based on the ECOMOS policy guidance that was published in March 2021. And the policy guidance, as we all know, serves as a guide for the fulfillment of the SDGs through heritage practices. And it's also... Um, it was also a request um, by the SDG working group to create a toolkit as a set of guidelines in localizing engagements, projects, and programs that connect cultural heritage practices and the SDGs. So the objectives of the localization manual was to provide information on the working processes of the ISCs, um, national committees, and working groups for the localization of the policy guidance, and also to showcase the different projects and initiatives by ECOMOS national committees, ISCs, and working groups, and also to present the other efforts by the different groups in ECOMOS that relate to cultural, her cultural heritage and sustainable development. So these uh, the, um, the five Ps are the link between the policy guidance and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So it's people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnerships. And um, I specifically wanted to point out these four SDGs that relate that are relevant to heritage. So it's um, goal number four, quality education, 11, sustainable cities and communities, eight, decent work and economic growth, and 12, co responsible consumption and production. 
So the development of local localized action strengthens the notion of heritage as a positive contributor to sustainable development and opens up more opportunities for her heritage practices to become better aligned with development objectives. And it also allows stakeholders at the local level to be more involved with achieving global goals for development and achieving social unity. So for the data collection of my research project, um, I did an online survey questionnaire through Google Forms and I had, I received 28 responses. Um, and then I asked, since I had three mentors for this project, which was Gab, um, Kenneth and Becke. So they, they gave me feedback on the pre preliminary document. And then I also got supplementary information from the policy guidance and the e-commerce action plan of 2017. So this is um, a screenshot of how the Google for the online questionnaire that I made looks like. And the concepts to localize the policy guidance for heritage and the SDGs. So as I said, the strategy planning meeting of the Sustainable Development Goals Working Group was held on May 3, 2022. So it was the starting point for the creation of the localization manual where they requested for um, such a toolkit for the awareness campaign of ECOMOS with their projects. And so the six essential points as drivers of implementation are finding local solutions and innovations, encouraging long-term thinking, championing heritage practitioners to contribute to bigger societal issues, building top-down and bottom-up engagement, and identifying relevant indicators that establish heritage as a contributor to sustainable development and establishing significant partnerships. So these are the guiding principles for advocacy and actualizing strategies, which are ensure focus, consistency, mobili mobilization, communication, concrete outputs, universality, encouragement, and culture and nature approach. So the five um, steps in the framework methodology for implementation and localization that I created was conversation. So this is a discussion between the national committees or the international scientific committees and working groups for possible localization initiatives or projects that they can do within their own country or their own city and mobilization which is for the expansion of knowledge and familiarization of the committee members with um, the local situation or like how to better encourage the people in that place to become more involved and also um, to create an internal group to handle projects and divide the tasks for the different programs. So number three is partnerships, and it's important to form partnerships with relevant local stakeholders, such as local government units or the private sector, and to maintain good, re good relations with these local partners. And number four is local visibility. So it's also important to build local visibility and awareness of the programs of ECOMOS through publicity materials, social media, and campaign launch events, such as webinars or workshops. And then five is the implementation of the core project or the main event. And so these are the five priority areas for the, for the different programs and initiatives of ECOMA. So the heritage practitioners, the youth, development actors, local organizations, and research institutions and universities. And so the conclusion was that the application of methods or processes by committees should be more organized when they carry out projects to reach the intended outcome. And committee leaders must mobilize their members to develop a baseline strategy to have a sound direction and achieve the intended results um, and to work together in promoting the importance of heritage for development and for the achievement of the SDGs and embrace learning from various stakeholders. So it could be like from different committee members or from the partnerships that we build and also the challenges, learnings and opportunities as motivating forces for further work and to improve, to continuously improve in the work that ECOMOS does. So this is um, the donut graph that Gabe also showed earlier and it shows 
some disparities between the different SDGs that Ecomos has been working on. So the biggest one would be SDG 11 and also SDG 13, which is climate action and quality education, which is SDG 4 and also SDG 17, which is partnership for the goals. So yeah, you can see that SDG 2, zero hunger and SDG 1, no poverty, they're a bit, um, there are not a lot of projects that are focused on these um, SEGs. So it would be good to like have a more balanced um, like uh, projects or initiatives for all of it. Thank, thanks, Maria. So I think the, some the colleagues later on the, from Ecomos Australia and, and, uh, uh, and others and the ISCS will also see that you, you gave like five um, uh, the framework for method or methodology for implementing and localization, right? So uh, I think that uh, different colleagues will have different ways of doing it. So it's not like one to five. It's actually sometimes it's partnership first or conversations later on. You know, everyone will have their own method. But uh, I think the main idea is to engage uh, different uh, members, different people, so that the, the conversation becomes wider and wider. And we can have more questions on that uh, with Maria later on. So hello, everyone. It's super nice to be here. It's very exciting to hear about. I didn't know about what Maria presented earlier. So it's, it's very nice to hear that there, there are such initiatives happening. And it's super nice to see so many familiar places, which I've seen in Sydney um, and some new uh, places as well. Um, so today I will be presenting the case of the Philippines and its um, its actions for localizing the, the SDGs. Um, and I will be speaking about this uh, in the position of um, a former intern with uh, Ecomos Philippines and um, and I will be presenting the work that I've I've uh, done within this position. Um, and I will be briefly touching about uh, upon the rationale for uh, behind the 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 work that was undertaken for for localizing the SDGs uh, with the heritage sector in the Philippines, the methodology that we employed, and I will be um, I will be stressing upon this this point especially because um, as as Gabriel said, you know there are different ways of doing this. Um, and I think it's important to take key points from each each example and maybe come up with you know an ideal methodology. Um, and then I will be discussing about um, the the focus group discussions that we that we we've analyzed, um, the findings, the conclusion, and finally I will be uh, briefly touching also upon upon the progress made since um, we've drafted the research uh, report. Um, right, so um, in 2021, um, ECOMOS Philippines has started the action of, of uh, localizing the international policy guidance, um, um, which was elaborated by, by ICOMOS International in, in June 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and um, they've released a call for internships, um, um, of which you know I was part. And together with a fellow intern uh, um, of mine, Shania Vergas, and guided by Kenneth, we've uh, started working on uh, drafting a, 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 a report a research report uh, which was based on analyzing the the focus group discussions that were organized for for this action um and the um, the entire work was based on the a research question which was uh, what are the direct and indirect linkages and the status of achieving the sustainable development goals in the field of heritage in the Republic of the Philippines. Um, and this uh, departed from a key assumption, which was that of uh, culture as being a specifically the uh, 
uh, the heritage sector uh, as being um, extremely relevant uh, for its potential in transferring its know-how to other sectors, uh, thus making the heritage sector a vital component as well in addressing the SDGs beyond the SDG uh, 11 target 4, which was um, uh, initially considered uh, uh, for heritage. So, uh, as I said, the methodology was based on analyzing the focus group discussions, which were gravitating around the uh, five P's, partnership, peace, planet, uh, people, and prosperity. Um, and these focus group discussions were held between uh, August 2021 um, until December 2021, with um, 40 heritage and allied professionals or stakeholders from 31 institutions and organizations, ranging from the national government, local, local government units, non-governmental organizations, civil society, private companies, and the academe, um, and which were backed, uh, backed up by observers from ECOMOS uh, Philippines and selected participants uh, valuable for, for the discussions. Um, and um, prior to organizing these focus group discussions, um, there were concept notes which were elaborated and circulated among the stakeholders um, in order to, to resume, you know, the, the objective of the focus group discussion and to kind of uh, give participants a means to prepare for, for the discussions as well. Um, and as you can see from uh, from this example, um, each concept note uh, contained, you know, um, also apart from a description of, uh, you know, examples, best practices, and um, uh, main points which were uh, addressed, which were, you know, um, aimed at being addressed within the focus group discussions. These were containing also um, guide uh, questions. Uh, and the specific SDGs which were expected to be addressed um, during the during the the discussion. Right. So um, as I said, the focus group discussion uh, discussions um, uh, incorporated and gathered um, professionals and experts from all sectors from throughout the country. Uh, they were held on Zoom. These were uh, then. Uh, uh, transcribed by me and Shania, and then kind of um, uh, analyzed. And um, each of these focus group discussion had a theme. For example, the one on people uh, was um, gravitating around the theme of heritage as a driver of sustainable development towards poverty reduction and reducing inequalities, and was addressing SDGs one, two, three four, five, six, uh, 10, and 11. So as you can see, you know, uh, each focus group discussion was kind of aiming to go beyond SG uh, 11 in its target and try to kind of uh, touch upon, upon all uh, SDGs. And, um, and uh, numerous uh, examples and uh, documents uh, and programs were discussed um, in order to, you know, assess uh, what the state is and uh, what the state the keywords uh, for people uh, which surfaced were poverty alleviation, network heritage, displacement, heritage mainstreaming, community development, and, and so on. For planet, um, the theme uh, was ambition, um, stepping closer to environmental sustainability that reflects cultural of values and protects heritage amidst climate change, with the following uh, SDGs being touched uh, and the documents um, as well. And the keywords that surfaced were indigenous knowledge systems, climate change, natural heritage sites, cultural landscapes, which was particularly uh, important. Uh, and at some point it was stressed that, you know, cultural a, a cultural landscapes approach should be part of of heritage uh, planning as a way of you know bringing natural and cultural heritage together and kind of stepping closer towards climate action. Um, then for um, for prosperity, uh, there was a discussion on the concept of or the Filipino concept of Bayanihan, 
uh, towards sustainable tourism and celebration of living heritage to enrich communities and the cultural economy. With the following um, SDG stashed and documents, programs, and examples cast, and with uh, the following keywords that surfaced, such as heritage based development. So there was a lot of discussions upon you know, uh, thinking and strategizing development in the Philippines based on its heritage and uh, thus uh, making heritage the core of, of every development strategy, um, but also natural heritage conservation. And this was particularly important and stressed multiple times as a way of underlining, um, you know, the, the Filipino view of what heritage is, um, you know, the importance that nature holds for indigenous populations in the Philippines, especially, uh, as well as community sustainability uh, and inclusivity. For peace, um, the title of the focus group discussion was Human Rights Based Approach. It's significant in maintaining peace and justice to achieving the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Heritage, uh, heritage, sustainable, um, heritage Sustainable Development. Um, and the following um, SDGs were attached, number 10, reduce inequalities, number, number 11, again, sustainable cities and communities, and number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, with the following documents, programs, and examples. And the keywords that surfaced were land distribu distribu distribution, internal displacement, again, um, there was the, the, the Filipino justice system was discussed, historical injustice for some of the communities throughout the, the Philippines, uh, conflict recovery, cultural diversity was particularly stressed, um, historical grievance was mentioned as an important aspect of, you know, creating dialogue between communities and fostering peace, as well as social cohesion. Um, the last FGD was um, on partnerships, um, and um, it was titled Our Shared Heritage Collaboration as the Key to Sustainable uh, Development. Sorry, I, I missed the word there. Um, and was uh, focused on SDG 11, uh, but also SDG 17, um, with, the, with, the, with the following documents, programs, and examples discussed. And with the keywords that surface being those of uh, impact assessment as a key process in uh, in um, implementing heritage projects, um, uh, stakeholders planning, local governance, heritage education, uh, human resources, natural resources, and so on, and so on. Right. So uh, as I said, um, each uh, each focus group discussion was transcribed, analyzed, and then based on these keywords and key findings, the keywords that I've just presented, and then key findings were formulated at the end of each uh, focus group discussion description. So um, there were um, some key points which which surfaced. Um, throughout the entire discussions, which were linked to, which we, we then categorized in um, in heritage, in, in, in the following themes, uh, heritage sector, general attitudes, development strategies, and also indigenous people, and especially, this was especially important. So with regards to the heritage sector, um, there was identified uh, the need to fill the gap with uh, within the educational pathways of heritage professionals so as to better equip them towards climate change related issues, promote interdisciplinarity and promote a cultural landscape management approach. As I said, this was particularly stressed. Um, active involvement in championing and regulating from the part of the national government and local government units with regards to general attitudes that need to be fostered in order to bring uh, to bring um, uh, the SDGs closer to the heritage sector and vice versa. Um, push for the acknowledge, acknowledge, acknowledgement of the value of indigenous knowledge for finding creative solutions for meeting the SDGs. With regards to development strategies, what was particularly stressed was the importance of free prior and informed consent principles whenever you know development planning was in, in place. 
um, involvement of various stakeholders in grassroots uh, consultations. Um, and it was particularly stressed that development should be in harmony with the availability of natural and cultural resources in the region um, and creating an enabling environment for local communities in order to you know, voice out their concerns and needs well, in relation to development. Um, in relation to indigenous people, there was, um, you know, a key point that I believe um, could be could be extracted from these uh, discussions, which was the need to change uh, uh, the definition of heritage. And as I said, you know, there was particularly stressing upon the concept of of natural heritage uh, as as it being you know uh, extremely relevant especially for indigenous populations um, and also the importance that natural heritage uh, yeah as I said uh, bears in the history of the Philippines and uh, kind of coupling indigenous people's communities values uh, with um, uh, with you know scientific knowledge and using using not using but kind of you know, enabling this kind of indigenous knowledge as a pool of, of knowledge that could be useful for, for the sustainable development. Uh, right. So, if we if we are to come to a conclusion, um, the what what surfaced was that there is a need for integrated approaches in designing strategies for the goals, and uh, recognizing the value of indigenous knowledge. There is a need for greater inclusivity and grassroots level consultations and interventions and matching conservation and development strategies and policies to the local natural and cultural heritage. Um, and the importance of traditional and indigenous knowledge uh, of sustainable management systems uh, of resources that, as I said, could be coupled with scientific approaches in order to envision you know, better strategies for, for reaching sustainable development. Um, so the result was, um, as I said, um, a research report, 107 pages long, uh, containing, um, you know, the description of each FDG with the key findings and the conclusion, but also um, recommendations uh, of, uh, so baseline recommendations for each of the seven FDGs and policy statements, again, for each of the FDGs. Uh, which were, you know, put into a table um, in parallel with those recommendations which are already included in the international policy guidance in order to have a better, you know, comparison of the similarities, but also um, the differences between the two. Um, and I've been informed that since we, we've uh, drafted the report, there, there was significant progress made. Uh, so there were efforts to revision the recommendations that I've just mentioned and the policy statements. And also there were um, there, there was um, a project coordination plan put into place for the localization of case profiles for the document, uh, which consisted of uh, four stages, uh, starting with the um, starting with the call for the case profiles, which was launched in 2022. And these efforts will be ending in, 2000, in December 2024, um, uh, when during the SDGs awards, the policy guidance document will be published. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Elena. So actually, uh, it is quite nice to see this. Uh, and, and for me personally, uh, coming from a, a, a Philippine perspective, you provided a, a different perspective that is not a national uh, perspective, so a third-person perspective, so that, that was really appreciated. I think later on, we should ask also our colleagues, uh, Linda and Ege, on what they think about what is happening with the policy guidance, uh, because it, they are the, the uh, authors of this work, and um, it will be great to get their feedback as well for, for these things. Okay, great uh, presentation, Elena. Uh, as uh, let, let's have uh, this is a time to discuss and uh, probably provide uh, in input. So for me, first, I I really see that there are patterns that we have seen from the first presentation, second and third, which is there's always the the engagement, you know, engagement of different people to understand the different parts of the issues, and then uh, coming together to figure out what it is that is the link, you know, and documenting that information 
to see where do we go forward, right? Um, um, in, in terms of questions um, from our uh, uh, three discussants, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, raise your hand or have a shout out and, and we can uh, talk about it. Or I can do a first question if need be. Okay. Uh, in fact, yeah. In fact, I had a question. <laughs> okay, go go for it, Shangshui. Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Well, uh, why I was uh, also listening to the previous two presenters' uh, result, I was wondering because I see so many keywords, and we also try to generate some keywords as a kind of you know starting point. But I want to ask uh, the the colleagues that how do you use all these many keywords? Or maybe I could put it differently. Uh, what do they mean to you or to your project? That's my question. <laughs> okay. So maybe uh, Elena, you can uh, share your perspective. So in terms of how we use them, uh, I mean, I guess that this is, you know, an approach which each of us has to decide upon. But the way that we've approached this is that we've extracted these keywords so that they would be useful for then kind of building up key findings. You know, this was the method that we consider that it was the best in order to kind of synthesize all these discussions because they were huge you've seen there were like various documents various persons examples so we needed to kind of synthesize all of this and so this was also a matter of efficiency and of using these for kind of you know coming to like solid conclusions if you want um and the, your second question was um how so how, was how it can be used how can it be used for how, how can be used yeah or what does what do they mean to you what do they mean okay yeah yeah because and so this, we'll, we'll, yeah yeah please i think that this is also you know kind of subjective and it depends on the context right so we've seen gabriel was presenting you know what what each committee has done nationally and then there were other discussions of you know what other actors have done with regards to this and i think that it was a, at some point there was a mentioning about the fact that the um the the arab region is kind of doing some actions for developing you know the concept of sustainability and what you know the arab region means through sustainability and i think that this is you know kind of the perfect explanation for all of this you know for each region and context, it can mean it can mean different things. Um, but you know, we've tried to couple it with the um, we we we've tried to have uh, into to take into consideration throughout the entire work the international policy guidance. That's why we've also chosen to kind of uh, parallel the the baseline recommendations and the statements um, that were included in the international policy guidance mm -hmm. with those that we've extracted um, because we wanted to, you know, uh, give them a common meaning somehow yeah. internationally. Yeah. If, if I may add to that, um, uh, Elena. What actually happened for the at least for the Philippines during the uh, focus group discussion is that there were discussions that were uh, people were saying similar themes, similar um, issues, and that had to be captured as a as a keyword that can be used to change the policy guidance to localize the document. So it was a, a more of a, let's say procedural thing that we were thinking because. The the one uh, the methodology that Elena explained is that from the international policy guidance, this was given to all the participants, and then uh, critique was provided based on let's say is it correct in the local context? Is it is it not? And then new words uh, came back. Uh, let's say this word uh, that uh, Elena mentioned. This uh, there's this Filipino term called bayanihan, which is uh, it it's like helping each other as a country. It's a, it's a very Filipino thing that is not, of course, I, I don't know, there's a, other terminologies that are used for different places, but that came out in these discussions and that is now integrated to the actual document that is uh, to be published. 
So it was important for that to to shift and localize the the perspective. Um, I think that's that's one way. Ege, uh, do you have uh, something to share as well? Thanks, Gabe. Hi, everyone again. Um, it's really great to um, join this meeting and see um, all the really exciting uh, work done. Um, and uh, I I feel the, you know, like a new sensation of being um, older and, and like uh, being from ancient history, but like following on the continuous work and evolution of this working group. We're so established now. I, I mean, I'm quite proud. So anyway, um, that's with the emotional part. My question is a bit more um, like, uh, let's say, no nonsense than that, which is impact assessment. Um, like, I always get the feeling that we um, start to get anxious about um, um, the proliferation of a lot of good work, body, the body of work, and and then um, not really focusing on um, like the, uh, the the performance indicators or what it was actually um, at the beginning that we set out to achieve. Have we achieved it or not? Or um, uh, like having checkpoints of actually seeing um, what is the actual output um, and impact that. Um, you know, we have achieved along the way um, really helps motivate one actually, and also steer us in the right direction of whatever do we do. So we don't waste resources mm -hmm. on something, you know, repetitive work or um, maybe also self-motivate, um, see, you know, where are our strong points are, our weak points are, and that Im impacts or outputs can have different scales, different, um, you know, times, time, timelines, um, and having little outputs along the way, I think, is is just as valuable as having, you know, a culture goal in fifteen years. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, and they're all, all valuable. So, um, uh, how do, do the presenters feel, for example, or I mean, what 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 are your observations or you know, um, comments on um, the the forecasted impact of your particular projects and um, how it contributes to the larger picture of the impact we're trying to achieve. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's my yeah. question. Maybe um, Maria, um, Shang Shui or Elena, you can answer that, yeah. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I got uh, Shang Shui, uh, yeah. Jump, yeah. Jump up. Well, yeah. at the moment, uh, at the moment, it's hard to say impact, but if I think uh, in a visionary way, uh, I think the first and the most important impact for our effort from a scientific committee is that we want to raise the issue of science and what is science and what is the role of science in the current challenges and the new dynamics of conservation. Because certainly the, 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 the way or the framework as already established since the 19th century, the so-called modern model, and especially developed uh, after the Second World War, we think it is changing. And so as, uh, for instance, as uh, I mentioned in the earlier um, concluding remarks, um, many of our members recognize actually uh, that kind of ideology that by doing very scientific investigation in laboratory settings actually a very uh sometimes they feel maybe not useless but very weak because we have much more complicated situation in the real world or even speaking of a particular pro conservation project the real uh indicators and the conditions and local uh, environment from the humanity to the you know local climate and everything that might impact the conservation uh, strategy or method are not something we can directly uh, define in a lab based method or methodology so they are actually very well recognized this uh, weakness or gap and they are already uh, i mean the scientists from some committee already uh, wrote quite a lot and published about this issue so the first impact I would say to raise again this uh, long-standing problems uh, in the new agenda, and we hope this time uh, the sustainable development goal approach uh, could integrate it in mm. this um, yeah long-standing problems. Mm. Thanks.
thanks, Anshuri. I think um, also, Ken, you wanted to respond, uh, James, you wanted to respond or Ken wanted to respond to the question because I have a feeling that you will, Ken will want to respond to something. Is it a question or a response? Uh, it, it really also uh, okay. to help answer that question. Okay, uh, sure, go, go uh, ahead. There's something really positive uh, to uh, okay. try and give something to back is, I'd really like your, um, for the last speaker, uh, Cheng Shu, if I could have your contact details, um, if you could just email, put them in maybe there because I was contacted for my role in the energy and sustainability, the Incomos Scientific Committee to help uh, formulate for the 20th Century Society, their agenda for sustainability. And actually what you have just spoken of and in the sense of it, just all the thing, little things you ticked off when you said your presentation, which was, uh, we also deal with concrete, we also deal with other things and stuff like that. Um, so I would love to share that because they're going through the process, what you wanting to do. Um, so they're thinking of developing that. So if I could share your details, if that would be possible, or at least a contact within your organization, who I, uh, within your scientific committee, that at least they can touch base so they can follow up so there isn't that repetition so to help answer your question yes there is going to be some positive feedback because there'll be two committees getting some work done there um, <laughs> but there is another one that i do think is really important which is highlighted in the last uh, presentation in particular but also mentioned in the others the act of actual conservation is a sustainability thing yeah. and i think that's something that's really really important the idea that maintaining a building is now I've done a whole bunch of scientific putting actual numbers to this, that actually just maintaining a building is an incredibly sustainable thing to do. It lowers the energy consumption of the building. It makes it more efficient. It's, you know, it, you help preserve that embodied carbon that's gone into the building of the building. It stops the problems of demolition. And I think that the, actually highlighting that, because we just don't say that enough. And, you know, certainly the studies that I was doing in the UK to do with the housing stock, we were getting better performance by maintaining a building than we were by, in inverted commas, traditionally sustainably refurbishing the building, like putting solar panels on the roof and all those other stuff. And so I think that that as a way forward and a framework is a really important one um, because obviously we're very strong on the cultural side. We understand the cultural side, which is not discussed. Um, and I know, uh, 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 Gabe, you were there with, um, Andrew Mason at a presentation yeah. recently where the embodiment of cultural values just isn't even done on the the um, funding for World Heritage Banks and funding banks. Mm -hmm. That assessment needs to be much more enforced. So I think it's really important that we highlight that actually doing conservation work in itself is an incredibly powerful sustainability tool. Um, and even on the uh, financial front, it's much, you know, Foster and Keenan have shown this for years that actually preventative maintenance is the most cost effective way of keeping a building going. All of that other stuff, though, all that data is there. And I think we need to, as a committee, really highlight that conservation is that real strength. Um, it's kind of like a hidden superpower in the sustainability because it really is, you know, when we're looking at the figures of conservation uh, of energy, just maintaining a building is one of the primary first steps in that and incredibly effective. So it's really that little bit that you put as a little snippet in one of your slides. I want to actually grab out and put it as a whole slide and to say yeah. by doing conservation and preserving the building, whether it be stone, timber, anything, you're actually being incredibly culturally, economically and environmentally sustainable. So it's just my, mm. my comment and as a positivity, but I would love for your contact details if you could send them to me um, um, because I'd love to share that with the uh, 20th Century Society who are, and you may be able to share some of your points there. Okay, so yeah. that's just my point, but Thank brilliant you. presentations. Thank you, you all. Okay. Thanks, thanks, James. Actually, it's the, the thing there is that heritage is an act of sustainability, right? The, the, the act of preserving means that the life continues for a, a, a site. Um, well, I, I just other, what I want to say, Gabe, is it's, it is on the other measures. That's my point. Mm -hmm. Is it's not just the preser pre pre the preservation of it. It actually lowers the carbon emissions dramatically. Mm -hmm. It lower it's cost cost effective wise. Like I know it's really boring, and we don't like to use the word money in this committee. But if we're talking about what's the best pounds per spent, looking after a building is by far the most effective cost to benefit ratio. Um, you know, Peter Cox, the outgoing mm -hmm. president of the scientific committee has shown that for years. 
So I think it is something that we need to shout a bit more about. But I'll shut up now. Yeah. Uh, Egil said that he wants, he wants to talk about more money. Of course, this is also very important. <laughs> okay. Ken, uh, do you have a, um, something to ask or some comments? Yeah. Um, so just a quick comment. Um, so Egil was asking, how's the KPIs? Um, yeah. So if you remember when we first... I think it was three years ago, so we've been together for three years. Um, when we proposed the project, which was supposed to end this year, um, there was a major, um, how do I say this, a, a bump in the road because we're trying to get funding to do the policy guidance, the, the book, and of course the call for case profile, which would of course needed some money and um, more programming. Well, this has been recorded. Um, so we we try our best not to over um, maximize the volunteer that we the volunteers, of course, the the membership. So we 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 made some time. We tried to pitch this with the governments and all. However, there were some um, limitations, and that's why we're not able to secure until. Um, Late last year, we decided to push through even without funding. Until recently, uh, I don't want to share the whole information. It might get jinxed. And um, finally, we might be able to get funding. Um, hopefully, <laughs> this is currently being recorded. So uh, I, I just really hope that it will push through. And the project for the policy guys might extend for another year. So maybe it will end by 2025 or end of 2024, as in the plan shared by Elena. And we're going to have a meeting with that organization who's, who has the same goal with the SDG working group. And hopefully, yeah. yeah, hopefully it will push through. So that's the progress. So in terms of KPI, we intended to finish in 2023. There was some late up, um, some bump on the road, all because we wanted to... Mm -hmm create an ecosystem where heritage profession is getting paid. And I guess, hopefully, it will pay off all that, that effort of waiting and pitching and putting across the message that we, that we would want to for, for the project. So thank you very much to Maria and Elena. Uh, you you are part of this um the work that is happening at Ecomos Video Pits, and of course, everyone here at SDG Working Group International. So we'll yeah. give you more updates, hopefully uh, mid next year. So yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Ken. So just just a very quick one for for that. Actually, um, I, and this is something that uh, Ecomos Australia will also say is that in the beginning of each of these uh, engagements, uh, even uh, ISE is in Stone, Ken, uh, Ecomos in Philippines, all of them have a, a target. So when we discuss, I always advise do a, uh, uh, let's say a timeline, uh, one year, two year, three year uh, timeline so that you actually know when, uh, if you achieve something. So I think uh, later on, Ecomos Australia will present and they will also have their own timeline that uh, they, uh, they they will provide. Okay, we let's uh, have Linda and Shang Shui and then afterwards we will have to move on to the presentation of Ecomos Australia. Linda, please. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, I have some good news. Chang Shui will be joining us at the University of Hong Kong. So, yay, we will have all her right. with us Fantastic. in January. Um, but <clears throat> I want to know if I am all for sustainability and all for conservation, but I want to know if the data on the link between sustainability and uh, conservation holds true in an Asian context. I know there's tons of data on the US, North America side and on the European side, but on the Asia, Asia Pacific and Africa, I'm not so sure if the data supports the link and this strong connection. Uh, I'm looking at projects being done here in Hong Kong, and of course, conservation here is problematic, but uh, depending on the age of the building, 
sometimes conservation technically is not very sustainable. I know this is a little controversial. So I'd be curious to know if there's enough data in other con uh, other continents to support this um, discussion as well. James, maybe you would have one. I don't want to jump in because very polite uh, since someone else has had the hand in. Yes, there's lots of data. Uh, I could jump in. Uh, I work. Uh, we have enough. Uh, our university has a base in Hong Kong, so yes, we uh, um, have that data. Um, I think where it comes in is where that data needs to be understood. Is what are the alternatives? And I think that's where the it, it becomes very strong. Um, I'm just doing this one now where if we compare demolition and replacement uh, with that um, compared to you know, looking after the building, the data is very incredibly strong. I think where it's very important, and I think you have highlighted a real kind of uh, Western bias in where a lot of the scientific data does come from, is that everything's got to be magnified. And I, what I mean by that is that what we would say um, the pre preventative maintenance in um, uh, in the UK may be every 10 years because of your almost perfect biological and pathological uh, conditions that you have in the tropics, uh, those those things need to be done in a much more vigorous way. So, for example, the timber will rot much quicker. I think I've had conversations with colleagues in, at the University of Hong Kong on this, where actually the following the European framework doesn't quite work in Hong Kong because you actually need to preserve the wood, you need to preserve the timbers on an annual basis, not an every five year basis, simply because of the a patholo pathological way put there. So I think it, you are right in that, that the data can't be instantly transferred, but the theorem of preventative maintenance being a very effective way does work. It just, it needs to be tailored to the climate that you're dealing with. Mm. And I think that's something that's very, very important. And I think this is where it draws really interesting correlations with what Gabe is trying to put here, is that there is a localism that you need to understand the local conditions. And it's not just at a national level, but also the environmental and the cultural ways. Um, it's very interesting, the European idea in the UK, it was the, the extra day in a leap year was given over to maintenance. So every four years you get an extra day, the farmer would go out and use that day to repair his building. And that's where we get the idea from. But obviously, if you've got a rot or an impact or a pathology that's going to be magnified by your climatic conditions, then you need to adjust that to not every two years or every year. And that's what's really interesting. Um, and again, that's something that... Um, Sorry to jump I, in, but I guess uh, my issue is not with continued use or maintenance, but more in terms of adaptive reuse. And that's where I think the numbers don't quite add up so much. And I think we need to be a little careful when we're talking about conservation in the broad term and then on these specific areas. But I will shut my yeah. mouth now. No, no, no. I would love to... Uh, you and I please, can have I'll put my contact yeah. details in there. Um, in, yeah. in the chat, um, uh, uh, Linda, and I would love to have a conversation because I've got Perfect. some collective data. Um, yeah. And I'm sure I'm probably going to refer you to colleagues uh, or people that you already know in Hong Kong who are doing stuff on this. Uh, so I'd love to, I'll just put it in there. Uh, I don't want to Great. interrupt. Okay. Thanks. Okay, quick one. Um, uh, Shamsha, before you say something, for Linda and our, I see that we actually have a lot of people from the Asia Pacific region. Uh, the SDGs working group has been tasked to, to rally the Asia Pacific uh, e-commerce members so that the sustainable development is one of the conversations that will be collected for the next three years. So I will be asking uh, colleagues who are from the Asia Pacific and uh, Linda, uh, as a person who's coming from the, from the Hong Kong region, I will set up a meeting in January 2024 for that to uh, and and uh, different national committees have already said yes to uh, putting this together. Okay, so uh, Shang Shui, uh, you will have uh, the last uh, uh, point before we go to e-commerce Australia. Uh, no, resolved. I already shared in the comment. Ah, okay, box. good. <laughs> so so um, maybe just one quick one. So because we didn't hear Maria and uh, uh, Mo, uh, Maria, for you, hearing all these uh, uh, different national committees, uh, national committee and ISC, from the work that you've done in tw uh, 2022, uh, what do you think are 
you know uh the good points and bad points uh, um and has it improved what do you, what are your thoughts uh, from the general discussions for me since i've only been with ecomos for a short um time but i feel like there's i mean there's a lot of projects going on but it's more of the awareness of the of like external stakeholders that still needs to be um like captured to be more involved with the projects um and i think the like in the priority areas that i pointed out with my research is i think it's the youth that would also be essential in um like taking part in these projects and then encouraging them to be more involved. And also, it's also the, the youth that, um, yeah, would be crucial in like spreading the awareness of these projects on the local right. level. Fantastic. So I think that's what the, the focus of ECOWAS Jordan is. And I do hope that the other colleagues will also embrace uh, maybe more of the national committees. The ISC is a little bit more difficult because really experts are coming from from a higher level of discussion. But let's see if uh, ISCs can also penetrate the youth uh, in discussions. But uh, I really have to cut uh, so that we can have our colleagues, three colleagues who are waiting to discuss. Thank you very much for this wonderful conversation between uh, three discussants. Questions, I think. Um, uh, James had his hand raised since the middle of the presentation, but I don't know. James, <laughs> do you have a question? <laughs> uh, no, it's not really a question. Uh, just really to be sure, um, you've got Rachel Jackson. Uh, I don't know if she's been part. Yeah, I was going to say she's vice president uh, with alongside myself uh, on the International Scientific Committee for Energy and Sustainability. So anything we can do on behalf of the committee, I think I speak for her as well, will anything we can do to help we would love to and if your committee wants to join our meetings or wants to uh liaise with us we'll be very open to that of course so anything we can do to help or contribute to um even if it's just can we have some databases and some things then more than happy to okay thank you very much for that support yes we're, we're absolutely looking forward to that kind of partnership that's wonderful yeah i i know rachel's been away from australia on a research project so i don't know how much she's been participating in the local committee but she's very active in the international scientific committee so she might be a good kind of touch base between that might be a linkage which you're trying to build now um so i presume you know rachel uh, yes um, we, we yeah, had yeah. a brief discussion at the ga in september yeah. and um and she provided some awesome resource uh, resources from your scientific committee and we can definitely see overlaps and potential collaboration and um yeah we'll be reaching out shortly okay that's grand all right that's all so. thanks. Uh, thanks james i think carla wanted to say something as well carla hi hi can you hear me oh Good. Yes, no video though. Okay. Um, excellent work. Excellent ideas. I like bold, impossible dreams. I'm in. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm moving. I'm moving my membership to Australia. I'm just closing some some work in Brazil now at the moment, and I dedicate more time here. Uh, so I'd love to participate as well. I am a frontline uh, heritage professional. So I am in the desert with the Aboriginal people. So uh, my, my application of the SDG uh, policy guidance is more practical uh, and co-designed with Aboriginal people in the field. So if I can help with practical uh, knowledge and the experience, uh, we, we can talk, I can help as well. So Thanks. glad to be here to help. Thanks, Carla. Fantastic. And uh, as um, probably people don't know, Carla was the key translator for the po Portuguese uh, policy guidance. So uh, she knows the policy guidance in both English and in Portuguese. So uh, she's a good resource to have. Um, one thing for me, um, Shosh, uh, Anthony and Joanne, 
I saw the timelines. Uh, good to have the commencing, but maybe having uh, something at the end is good. So that what Aegi was saying about when do you actually evaluate? Because if it's continuing yes. and never ending, and you might not be ha having that opportunity to do a cycle of uh, review. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, I think we will work on our timelines over the course of the next couple of months. I think having new membership and having uh, uh, multiple people who can work with us will be of benefit there. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I think uh, for us, what we did, um, and Elena and our other, there's a lady that is here. She probably left already. Our, uh, we have a new intern in Ecomas Philippines. So we encourage internships as well to help us boost the the membership to do more things of course we're all uh uh you know volunteers have big dreams and hopefully have funding but uh interns are amazing resource that uh, as elena has done uh they've also she has also published the work you know intellectual knowledge is uh, shared to not just heritage practitioners but also the the people who want to learn that knowledge and you know uh spread that news more and maybe the, those interns who will join ECMOS uh, uh, Australia in the future, you know, mm. yeah, that is another way. All right. Um, I know that we're over time uh, for 20 minutes and I, I thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I, I'm excited to see that there are now more synergies that are happening. Linda Zhang uh, is moving to Hong Kong and working with uh, Linda and uh, very much uh, co different collaborations that are happening. Advanced Merry Christmas, advanced uh, Happy Holidays. Uh, for those who don't celebrate, it's just the end of the year. It's always a good ending to you know the year. Think about what, uh, what the future holds. Uh, imagine what has happened for the last uh, months. And uh, I wish you a very relaxing time for December. And uh, let's keep each other um, uh, in contact by email and wishing you all, all wonderful uh, weekend uh, for everyone.